Hello, our group is focusing on stem cells, and for news of the week this week, we'll be looking at the latest research coming out of Doug Melton's lab with respect to type 1 diabetes. My name is May, and I'm a junior at Harvard studying human developmental and regenerative biology. My name is Kang Ho Kim, I'm studying government, I'm a sophomore at Harvard. My name is Mandy, I am a senior at Harvard studying human developmental and regenerative biology. My name is Richard Chang, I'm a senior at Harvard College, I'm studying economics. So the biggest thing in biology news this week has definitely been the big diabetes breakthrough coming out of Doug Melton's lab. So a lot of people are really excited about this as a potential cure and treatment for type 1 diabetes. So what Doug Melton's lab has been able to do is generate mass amounts of fully functional human pancreatic beta cells in vitro, which to date has never been done before. Before we jump into diabetes breakthroughs from the Milton's lab, we'll briefly explain what diabetes is. Diabetes is usually a lifelong and chronic disease in which there is a high level of sugar in the blood. To understand diabetes, it is important to understand the normal process by which food is broken down and used by body for energy. Several things happen when food is digested. A sugar called glucose enters the bloodstream. Glucose is the source of fuel for the body. An organ called pancreas makes insulin. The role of insulin is to move glucose from the bloodstream into muscle, fat, and liver cells where it can be used as fuel. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas to control blood sugar. Diabetes can be caused by either the pancreas not producing enough insulin or cells not responding to insulin properly or both. The symptoms of diabetes include blurred vision, excessive thirst, fatigue, hunger, urinating often, and weight loss. After many years, diabetes can lead to other serious problems such as eye problems, painful sores and infections of the leg or foot, damaging nerves in the body, kidney problems, weakened immune system, and increased chance of having a heart attack or stroke. There are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes is caused by a lack of insulin due to the destruction of insulin pr producing beta cells in the pancreas. As a result, the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. Melton's study focused on this type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is caused by a combination of factors, including insulin resistance, a condition in which the body's muscle, fat, and liver cells do not use insulin effectively. Type 2 diabetes makes up most diabetes cases. It, it most often occurs in adulthood, but because of high obesity rates, teens and young adults are now being diagnosed with it. Many people with type 2 diabetes do not know, why, do not know they have it. We'll focus more on type 1 diabetes as Melton's stem cell research offers hope on type 1 diabetes patients. As I mentioned earlier, type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition in which pancreas produces little or no insulin. Type 1 diabetes can occur at any age, but is most often diagnosed in children, teens, or young adults. The exact cause of type 1 diabetes is still unknown. Most likely, it is an autoimmune disorder. With type 1 diabetes, an infection or unknown factor causes the body to mistakenly attack the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. There is no cure for type 1 for now, type 1 diabetes, but it can be managed through insulin injections, diet, and exercise. Treatment. Taking daily injections of insulin. This outside source of insulin brings glucose to body cells. However, the challenge is that it is extremely difficult to accurately know how much insulin is needed. We often see diabetes patients frequently checking the level of glucose in their blood system to make sure that their blood glucose level is in the right range. When too much insulin is injected, blood sugar can drop to a dangerously low level. When it's too low, body can again be starved of the energy it needs, and the blood sugar can, be, can rise to a dangerously high level. As the number of people with diabetes grew with worldwide, the disease takes an ever-increasing proportion of national health care budgets. Without, prim preven without primary prevention, the diabetes epidemic will continue to grow. Even worse, diabetes is projected to become one of the world's main disablers and killers within the next 25 years. The American Diabetes Association released new research in 2013. It, is, it estimated that the total cost of diagnosed, di diagnosed diabetes has have risen to $240 billion in 2012 from $174 billion in 2007. This figure represents a 41% increase over, five year, over a five-year period. These increased financial burden, health resources use, and lost productivity associated with diabetes pose a serious threat to national health. Among $245 billion, $166, $176 billion was from direct medical costs and $69 billion from reduced productivity. The largest components of medical expenditures are hospital and patient care, prescription medication to treat complications of diabetes, anti-diabetic agents, and diabetic supplies. Physician, of, 
physician office visits, and nursing residential facility stays. People with diagnosed diabetes incur average medical expenditures of about $13,700 per year, of which about $7,900 is attributed to diabetes. People with, di people with diagnosed diabetes on average have medical expenditures approximately 2.3 times higher than people who do not have diabetes. The diabetic toll in the United States is actually pretty significant. There are around 26 million Americans and growing who suffer from diabetes today in the United States, um, resulting from poor life choices, poor di diet and lifestyle, genetic predisposition, so diabetes runs in the family in some, in some instances, and obesity, which is a result of poor lifestyles, also contributing significantly to the number of people suffering from diabetes in our nation today. Um, current treatments are effective, but also not ideal. Um, so they're inconvenient ones, so if you're getting insulin shots several times a day or several times a week, that poses a problem on the consumer or the diabetic who has to go and seek out these um, vaccinations frequently. It's also expensive to have to do this treatment. And and adding to that expense is the lifelong toll. So you, once you're a diabetic and you start a course of treatment, you're more likely to have to do that treatment for the rest of your life. Um, so that really calls into the question and really brings the significance out in Doug Milton's work, seeing how we can reduce that toll on each person in the United States. So Doug Milton's journey with diabetes and diabetes research really began in the 90s when his a uh, child at, at an infant age was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. This led him to change his former course of research um, and direct it towards curing diabetes once and for all. And so he's gone through several stages um, of different publications that show his progress as far as making um, milestones in the area of diabetes research. And that starts with um, integrating stem cells into his research in the early 2000s and his journey with that all the way up to his recent discovery um, today. So the major points are the diagnosis of his child, the stem cell nuclear transfer methods that he uses to then create cell lines to study diabetes, the iPS cell derivation breakthrough that he had, um, beta trophin discovery breakthrough, and then finally this week's breakthrough of the stem cell beta cell um, generation. So diagnosis. His son, Doug Melton's son, was diagnosed with diabetes at six months of age in an emergency rush to the hospital. A quick thinking nurse tested his urine and discovered that he had loads and loads of sugar in the urine, which meant that he had none in his body. And he was completely depleted of nutrients in that sense. And so they then ran a course of treatment and his son was saved. Um, but he now had this life out toll of carry on diabetes and how his life would be affected by that um, really had an impact on Doug Melton and therefore he took a vow to seek a cure for diabetes to cure his son. He says it's something that any father would do. Later, a few years later, his daughter would also be diagnosed with diabetes, further uh, driving home his mission to cure diabetes. Somatic cell nuclear transfer. It sounds really fancy, but it's actually quite genius and quite simple. Um, and so for Doug Melton, this was a new way for him to really look at how diabetes formed or works within a cell um, and using these cell lines. So he used it as a way to create new cell lines on which he could use, on which he could perform his experiments. Um, and so essentially what that means is, or SCNT, what it is, is you take the nucleus of a cell from a diabetic cell and implant that in an embryo, in a human embryo um, or a human egg cell. And then from there, you're able to create subsequent cell lines that have the traits of that original diabetic cell. Um, and this was really, really helpful for him in order to perform different experiments on different types of diabetes and manifest differently in certain people. And so for him, this was really genius and it was really amazing. He did this um, in conjunction with Kevin Egan, who has now also become a pretty big giant in the realm of stem cell biology. Originally, this had a lot of pushback from the university and worldwide. There are a lot of discussions about how ethical it was to be able to take human embryonic cells um, and use them for other uses other than childbearing. Um, also, how would you acquire these cells was another huge issue. Um, and so just the general ethical discussion was pretty big at the time. And so the provost of Harvard actually made a landmark and a huge impact on Doug Melton's research by actually approving the protocol to use embryonic 
um, cells or em embryos in general for his research for diabetes. Um, and so once that was established, Doug Melting could then go forward. Obviously there, were two, there was pushback from the Catholic Church, there was pushback from other faculty at Harvard. Everyone thought that what the Harvard professors wanted to do was then clone people and clone diabetes patients in the lab, which is absolutely not what they wanted to do, or that was not the course that they were taking, but he had to go through a lot of stigma in order to move forward with his next research. So now that we've talked a little bit about what Doug Melton has done in the past, let's take a minute to focus on why this new discovery is important. This is the first time that fully functional human pancreatic beta cells have been generated in mass quantities in the lab. And this is especially important for a couple of reasons. One of them being that up until this point, this has not been a feasible procedure at all. And the key factor involved in these beta cells and why they're important for diabetes is insulin. So we'll talk a little bit about how insulin is related to diabetes and why these cells in particular are especially important. So the procedure by which this was done started with human embryonic stem cells or human IPS cells, which is induced pluripotent stem. And what Doug Melton and his team were able to do is incorporate a series of factors to direct the differentiation of the stem cells. And finally, in their last stage, as you can see on the diagram, which is taken from the latest paper that just came out in Cell, you see that the final stage of these cells is a stem cell-derived beta cell. And these are then capable of all of the necessary functions that occur in a regular beta cell within the human pancreas. And these are shown to be fully functional in mice. So now the real question is, what do beta cells do? Their biggest function is to be secretory cells. They are present in the pancreas in humans, and they secrete insulin, which is in response to blood glucose levels, secrete amylin, which slows the rate of glucose entering the bloodstream, and they secrete C-peptide, which is a byproduct of insulin production. The key thing here, though, is that beta cells in type 1 diabetes are attacked or destroyed by the immune system in the patient. So the ability to generate fully functional beta cells in the lab could potentially be a cure or a treatment for the disease because we can replace the damaged or missing beta cells in patients suffering from type 1 diabetes. So the key factor here is the function of the new beta cells. Prior to this, we have been able to direct differentiation of stem cells to form various cell types, including muscle, skin, and neurons. But everything up until now has been not quite as functional as the cell should be in vivo. Um, and more importantly, they couldn't be mass produced. But the exciting thing about the new stem cell derived beta cells from Doug Melton's lab is that they can be mass produced in quantities large enough for transplantation. They express markers found in mature beta cells in humans. They flux calcium in response to glucose, package insulin, secrete insulin, and can respond to glucose levels accordingly in vitro and in vivo. The importance of this is that these cells are fully functional compared to human beta cells as they would be in vivo, and that means that they're easily transplantable. The change in government policy regarding stem cell funding can be credited to Doug Malton's discovery. During Bush administration, both in 2005 and 2007, Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act was passed both in House of Representatives and State Senate. However, Bush vetoed the act and the House of Representatives failed to override the veto. This act would have allowed a FAT funding for stem cell research on new lines of stem cells derived from discarded human embryos created for fertility treatments. However, something surprising happened during Obama administration. In 2009, March 9th, Executive Order 13505 was passed. It removes barriers to responsible scientific research involving human stem cells. It also revokes a Bush presidential statement of August 9, 2001. An Executive Order 13435, which is expanding approved stem cell lines in ethically responsible ways. Both with the presidential statement and executive order prevents many of the stem cell research funding to available. From Bush administration to Obama's administration, the stem cell line increased substantially from 20 to 195. As you can see from the chart from 2002 and 2013, NIH stem cell research funding 
a clear trend can be seen. In 2008 to 2009, there is a substantial growth of funding in 2009. And in 2009 and 2011, there is a steady growth of funding available for stem cell research. Let's look at the United States state laws regarding human embryonic stem cells. In Arkansas, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, North Dakota, and South Dakota, but all of these states prohibit the creation and destruction of human embryos. In California, in the Proposition 71 was passed in 2004, which allows a $3 billion state funding to state stem cell research, and this will allow annual, annually $300 million for stem cell research. In Missouri, in 2006, Amendment 2 was passed. It prohibits any creation or any deviation of uses of human cloning. In New Jersey, in 2004, S1909A2840 was passed. It permits uh, the human cloning for the development and uh, harvesting of human stem cells. In economics, positive externality occurs when the consumption or production of a good creates a benefit to a third party. For example, positive externalities in the housing market leads to improved local communities, improved public health, and better environmental standards. Also, when you consume education, you get private benefit, but they also benefit the rest of society. You're able to educate other people, and therefore, they benefit as a result of education. Another example, a farmer who grows apple trees provides a benefit to a beekeeper. The beekeeper gets a good source of nectar to help make more honey. Melton's research is a great example of a positive externality. Oftentimes, medical breakthrough, such as equipment, drugs, and new methods leads to a series of new development or new branches of science. Melton already mentioned in his interview that he hopes other researchers to take the procedure and improve upon it, making it faster, easier, and more efficient. Other institutions already announced that they will repeat Melton's experiment. For example, Columbia University Medical Center will try to repeat Melton's experiment immediately. Also, Melton's research team is currently collaborating with MIT to create an encapsulation technology that could protect the cells from the immune system. So finally, let's talk a little bit about the implications of this work that's come out of Doug Melton's lab. We can use these cells as human models for diabetes. And this has been done before with somatic cell nuclear transfer, as Mandy mentioned. But the exciting thing about this is that these cells should be identical, functionally speaking, to the cells in the patient. So they serve as a better model for researching the disease in vitro. This also has large implications for a future study on betatrophin, as Doug Melton has worked on in the past. And the insulin secreting beta cells that are, have been created now are going into clinical trials in the near future, we expect. And they're already being tested in non-human primates, which creates a lot of opportunity for these to reach medical use and to become a totally viable treatment and potential cure for patients suffering from type 1 diabetes, as well as paving the way for future research towards type 2 diabetes and other subtypes of this disease and many others. So we expect to see a lot more research in terms of direct differentiation of stem cells, not only from Doug Melton, but also from a lot of other top researchers in the stem cell field.